Abydos, um, the burial site for the first kings uh, and queens of Egypt. Um, this is lecture six in our anthropology class. And we're going to be taking a look at some of these um, tombs that have been excavated, what they tell us about um, the early Egyptian kings and queens, and we'll take a look at some possible human sacrifice. Abydos, or Abedju, um, in, as the Egyptians called it, was a fairly ancient town um, that we've mentioned before when we looked at um, Aquata 1 through 3 in the reading that I gave you. Um, it's the burial place of the rulers of Dynasty 0 and 1, though um, scholars aren't sure exactly why, what drew people to this place. Um, it was close uh, to um, the heart of Nakwada culture, um, which is the immediate one of the immediate forerunners to the Egypt that we know um, in popular culture. Um, perhaps there was something religiously significant about this place uh, to these folks that they selected this area in Egypt. Um, perhaps it was just good materials and good building site. Um, we just don't know. Um, we do know that it becomes very famous as a site of Osiris worship, and uh, it's so overrun with Osiris worshipers that in uh, later periods in Egyptian history, um, the tombs of the earliest rulers of Egypt are actually plundered because people are looking for Osiris's tomb. Um, significant, I think, for Egyptian history is the fact that this is the earliest writing um, we have in Egypt, um, 3,300 BCE, uh, 5,000 years ago. Um, though it's debated exactly, you know, to what extent um, this is really writing, um, or is it just merely pictorial representations to help people keep track of things? Um, but in many cases, it does look um, and um, have characteristics that will be very much like later Egyptian um, hieroglyphs. Um, and finally, um, one of the things that uh, we notice here as well as elsewhere and other burials um, is the, the tendency to cover um, these large burials with mounds. Um, and you'll see the mounds really take shape um, later on in elite tombs elsewhere. Um, in Arabic, the mound shape itself um, can be, came to be known as the mastaba, and um, it means bench. And Lots of scholars speculate that the, the preference for the mound shape might have been a nod or throwback to the Ben Ben, um, the original mound from which all creation emerged. Um, I mean, it could have also just been for practical reasons as well. Um, where I come from, um, graves are mounded over by um, uh, gravel, white gravel. Um, so it creates a sort of lovely domed appearance in the mountains of Western North Carolina, where I'm from. Um, and this mounding effect um, was, you know, a holdover from days when coffins could get flooded with water and the burials could sink. And so uh, having the mound helped mark the place more effectively. So there could be lots of reasons for this. Um, scholars, of course, are awfully speculative with the archaeological evidence. Uh, but in many cases, we just don't know. Um, here is a map of uh, some of the burials at Abydos. Um, there are quite a several uh, areas for burials beyond uh, just those for um, Dynasty Zero and 
Dynasty One rulers. Um, but you can see just the layout here that um, we've got, you know, the supposed uniter of Egypt, though he probably didn't, um, and his son Hor Aha. Um, we see previous rulers to Narmer, um, Ka and Irihor. Um, we've got um, later rulers. We've even got queens, Merneith. Um, and the size of these burials, um, they get increasingly large. Narmer doesn't have a very impressive tomb at all. So let's take a look at a few of these um, burials and see what they can tell us about the ancient Egyptians and Abi at Abydos. Um, here is a picture of what uh, we typically think of with a mastaba later. Um, don't you love the fact that I found this illustration <laughs> uh, in, not in English? Uh, Construcción de la mastaba. Um, this is not what the um, mounds at Abydos would have looked like, but it gives you an idea of the shape. Um, that um, you would kind of expect um, over these um, Dynasty Zero and Dynasty One tombs. King Scorpion. Well, you read about him in, in the reading that I wrote for you on uh, Nequata One through Three. Um, his tomb is labeled UJ. Um, it's uh, divided chambers, so that's going to set us up for later in Egyptian tomb construction of thinking about rooms in a tomb um, rather than just dump you in the ground, throw a mat on you and throw some sand on top. Um, interestingly enough, the chambers are not separated completely from each other. There are vertical slits so that the uh, chambers are connected to each other, um, even though Nobody's going to be traveling through these slits because um, it's a tomb, it's a burial. Um, and that's suggested to be a precursor to an Egyptian um, burial trend later of having uh, a slit that you can visualize um, a statue of the person buried through that and that person can look out um, We'll talk more about that later. So maybe these slits are for that purpose. Um, there is evidence of a wooden shrine, uh, which is going to be something we will see again and again and again. Um, something to uh, mark the burial of this important person. Um, something with maybe religious or personal significance. Lots and lots and Lots of jars in this tomb, beer jars, wine jars from Palestine. We do find cosmetic tools. We find a scepter, um, uh, an indication of the right to rule and the right to power. But I think the most exciting thing for scholars are a whole bunch of tags um, that were found. You can see here, this is Scorpion's tomb all the divided chambers. Um, the tags were located in the tomb, uh, presumably around the jars and other materials to indicate where they came from um, or to indicate whose estate they were part of. Um, and the major excavator um, of um, Abydos has argued that these are rudimentary hieroglyphs. And he's noted that um, you can look at them and they read in the same direction as hieroglyphs do. Um, they follow the same rules. They look like later hieroglyph images. Um, so you would expect um, them to mimic what we will see later. Um, not all scholars agree that they are exactly uh, precursors, but I think it's pretty safe to say that um, these images are not random um, and they are communicative. They do have a communicative purpose. Um, 
So I think we're on fairly safe ground assuming that they do tell us something about the contents of the tomb, where they originate from, um, even if our readings might be a little more on the speculative side right now. What about Narmer? Um, his tomb is actually pretty modest. It's so modest that scholars are not sure it's actually his tomb. And they keep thinking maybe there's another one somewhere um, and we've missed it. I think personally that's assuming Narmer has to be this big figure who unified e Egypt and really perhaps did not do that. Um, Hor Aha um, may really deserve the credit for doing that. And unification's a process, not, not so much an event. Um, we know his tomb is built of mud brick, like many of the others. Um, you can see in this background image here um, what these bricks would have looked like. Um, we found poles indicating some kind of roof structure, and there's definitely wood, um, wood remains in um, these tombs um, to hold some kind of structure over top that then probably would have been covered with sand and other materials from actually digging them out um, in order to make the mound itself. Um, so is it his tomb? Well, we did find ivory pieces um, in the tomb that contain his name. Um, and that's often a tricky thing in archaeology. You know, does finding an object in a location actually tell you um, anything about that location? Unless you know how that object got there, can you be on safe, a gra safe ground assuming that this object is definitely the stamp of um, this person's tomb? Um, what if it appeared later? What if, you know, in all the ransacking of these tombs, uh, looking for the tomb of Osiris, people accidentally you know, carried something in. Um, so it's hard to say on that basis whether or not we actually have his tomb or not. Um, we certainly do have his name um, in lots of different places all over Egypt, and I looked at lots of indications of his name on many different pieces of artifacts and I'm in awe of Egyptologists who look at things and go, yep, that's definitely Narmer. Um, Nar, Mer, um, fighting catfish, chisel, um, uh, symbols here, uh, with a Horus falcon on top of a square that we'll be talking about uh, what that means a little bit later. Um, and I've seen so many images of this that look just like chicken scratch doodles um, that it's amazing to me that um, people can identify them clearly as this is definitely Narmer's. Maybe if you guys are interested in becoming archaeologists, you'll get uh, that proficient as well in recognizing these things um, from being out in the field so much. It'll just be second nature to you. Okay, I confess, Nithotep is our next person I want to talk about. She's not buried at Abydos. Um, I just want to talk about her because she's pretty um, freaking cool. Um, she's Narmer's wife, though perhaps some scholars think she's um, Hor Aha's wife. So we're not quite sure exactly um, where she fits in the story. Um, she had a very large burial, larger than Narmer's, um, pretty imposing burial overall. Um, and maybe that indicated something about her status. Um, lots of scholars think that she may have ruled in her own name at some point, either when Narmer died before Horaha, you know, came of age. Um, that she had power. Um, and so we look for this image here. This is um, a, a little artifact indicating her name, Neith Hotep. We find it um, in the same style as Narmer's name. 
um, this symbol here over top a box with these lines in it. And that is usually something only reserved for kings. So who is this incredibly powerful woman? Well, for one, um, she contains a very powerful name. Neith is a northern Egyptian goddess, a delta area goddess, who has a, quite a number of functions, but primarily she's a huntress. Um, she's a fierce warrior. Uh, she's linked to creation, to motherhood, protection, all kinds of other um, uh, functions. She's shown here carrying a, a wasp scepter and an ankh, the symbol for life. Um, and it's been estimated that uh, quite a number of early dynastic Egyptians bore her name in some way, shape, or form. Lots of the early queens in Egypt do. Um, Neithhotep's name means Neith is content or Neith is, is satisfied. So uh, this is a powerful woman with a powerful goddess um, attached to her identity. Um, so maybe she's just the world's first queen, powerful queen. Now for what you've been waiting for, human sacrifice, the grisly, gory stuff. Um, the tombs of Aha, Jer, uh, Jet, Den, and Ka all had human sacrifices um, located around the tomb structure itself. Um, this is kind of a surprise. Um, we don't have very much evidence for human sacrifice before these uh, first dynasty kings, and it dies out. Um, so it doesn't continue on. Most of the sacrifices are young men. They're between the ages of 20 and 25. Um, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 possible sacrifices. Um, not all of the people buried around the tombs um, are sacrificial. Some may have just been prominent people of the king's court and nobles. Um, but the people who are sacrificed um, are assumed to be available to the king in the afterlife. Um, and this is going to be something that we will see a little bit later in Egyptian um, culture as well. This idea that if you're wealthy and powerful when you die, you don't want to be in an afterlife where you're going to have to work. You want people to work for you in that afterlife, to do jobs for you. Um, there's some evidence, Petrie found some evidence, that some were alive when they were entombed. Um, we're not exactly sure how they all died. Uh, some scholars think poison, um, some think strangulation, and uh, so our evidence is a little bit like, eh, we're not sure here. But we are sure that the practice dies out because at some point it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to kill off all of the people of the court that you would need, you know, to have in the afterlife with you. You know, killing humans is quite a resource investment in the afterlife. Um, and it's not something that makes a lot of sense for the next ruler who's just going to have to go find people to like fill all of these spots. Um, so it might be that um, this momentary blip on the radar of human sacrifice was kind of like a quirky idea to ensure afterlife labor. And then people kind of realized as a practical thing, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, this is the tomb of Jer. It's got uh, the largest number of uh, sacrifices located around it. Um, I don't have any pictures of the victims. Uh, if you were looking for that kind of grisly stuff, sorry to disappoint. Um, as it is, 
This is a pretty interesting development in ancient Egyptian funerary history. And with that, I will sign off on this lecture on Abydos. See you next time.